Coming up, a Pulitzer Prize goes to a Navajo composer, and we meet an Oglala Lakota healthcare professional during National Nurses Week. Plus, is it too soon to put away the masks? I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Amadawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. We start in Colorado, where the Metropolitan State University of Denver is announcing a tuition waiver for citizens of all federally recognized tribes. The school says this is thanks to a combination of federal, state, and institutional grants. There are existing laws in the state that offer cheaper tuition to students who come from tribes with historical ties to the state. But now, MSU's funding is available for Colorado residents who are in enrolled in any of the 574 federally recognized nations. Students who meet the university's requirements can begin applying for the fall 2022 semester. A new series is coming to the Canadian streaming service Crave. It features an Indigenous cast, crew, and training for the next generation. APTN's Daryl Stranger takes us behind the scenes for this report. Action. Production is underway on the new six-part Crave series, A Little Bird, created by Jennifer Podemski and Hannah Moskovich in association with APTN and Resolution Pictures. Co-creator Jennifer Podemski gave a brief breakdown of what to expect. It is about a woman who is searching for her birth family, originally born in Saskatchewan. She was raised in a Jewish family in Montreal, and on on the eve of her engagement to a beautiful man, <laughs> she decides to embark on a journey to find the truth of her past. Award-winning filmmakers Elmaya Tailfeathers and Zoe Hopkins will each direct three episodes. The production of Little Bird is unique in that it features a training program for emerging and mid-career level Indigenous creators and crew while also paving a path for entry-level individuals to gain practical onset experience. One of the realities is that we, we as Indigenous people, represent um, such a low number of uh, uh, the workforce in the film industry. And that, that's, you know, due to a variety of reasons. But one of the things I think that's important to recognize is that training is a big part of building capacity. And in order to really uh, make, uh, make a place for ourselves in the industry, training is at the center of that effort. Jamie Felix is one of the actors and crew members part of the training program. He says it's a great way to get an overall feel for the industry. I, I know I'll be doing lighting, so I'll be learning about the lighting and I'll see how all the cameras are set up. I'll, I'll be I'll be like in the back watching everybody do their work while I'm, I'm, I'm just like watching, right? So I'll just say I'm learning a little bit here and there and then just by speaking with everybody on how to do this, how to do that and then and they're teaching me a little bit there, a little bit there and it's just like, oh nice. Even knowing people too, it's like, oh what do you do here? And then they're like, oh I do this. And it's like, oh okay. That's nice, man. Filming is expected to wrap up this summer and Little Bird is aimed for a release sometime in 2023. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Six-year-old Tiberius is looking for a hero. His mother, Tasha Newbill, who is a Nupiac, says a stem cell transplant could put his acute myeloid leukemia in remission. It would be life-saving for him. But finding a match is difficult because Tiberius is a Nupiac, black and white. It's something that a lot of people who are of mixed heritage or multicultural really have a hard time finding compatible donors because um, there aren't that many of us on the registries. 
Experts say getting tested and donating stem cells is easy for most people. One in five will have marrow removed from their hip and will be sore for a few days. To donate, the first step is to join the Be The Match registry. This process includes a cheek swab to see if you are a match for people like Tiberius or for another patient with leukemia or lymphoma. The National Hockey League playoffs are underway and there are four indigenous players showing off their skills. Round one features a clash with one of the NHL's most decorated indigenous players, TJ Oshie, who is an Ojibwe citizen. His Washington Capitals face off against the Florida Panthers and rising defensive talent Brandon Montour, who is a Mohawk citizen. And Ethan Bear, who is Cree, is in the hunt with the Carolina Hurricanes. Behind the bench with the St. Louis Blues is another Cree citizen, Craig Berube. And Berube will skipper his team against Connor Dewar, who is Métis and plays for the Minnesota Wild. To cheer on these indigenous hockey players, check your local listings for game times. And those are the headlines for the ICT newscast. Coming up, a Navajo woman is forced to step down from her Arizona congressional run. Dean Seneca gives us a pandemic update, and we meet a nurse who makes a difference. But first, Raven Chacon talks about his Pulitzer Prize. Stay with us. He is the first Native person to receive a Pulitzer Prize for musical composition. Awarded to Voiceless Mass by Raven Chacon, the piece premiered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in November. The Pulitzer panel said the work is a mesmerizing original work for organ and ensemble that evokes the weight of history in a church setting, a concentrated and powerful musical expression with a haunting visceral impact. Yes, this composition was commissioned last year by a music organization in Milwaukee called Present Music and was in collaboration with the United Church of Christ. And it was to utilize a massive pipe organ in the St. John the Evangelist Cathedral in Milwaukee. And so I wanted to write a piece, not only you know, in having this opportunity to write for this massive instrument, but thinking about the building that it is stewarded in the church and thinking about the church as a site of, you know, gathering and, and prayer, but also this contradiction that the space itself allows for voices to be heard. Choirs can sing in it, but sometimes, uh, you know, it, it does not offer the space for people to express their voicings. And this is not limited to the church. This is something we see in universities and the academy and elsewhere. And so it considers that, uh, you know, this futility of, of trying to give voice to the voiceless instead of offering space. Chacon teaches at the Institute of American Indian Arts. He offers this advice to students. You know, just being aware of the other artwork that's being made out there. And, you know, sometimes we're, we're skeptical of that, thinking, oh, you know, we'd, why, why learn about you know what's being made in the rest of the world and, and but artwork is a really good entry to other world views you know thinking about what people are are uh, addressing in their work let's say in Africa or Asia or a lot of these places there's there's artists all over the world and for indigenous artists to connect with them you know not necessarily the artists that are working in Europe and and the rest of the country but thinking about all these all these other ways of seeing the world, uh, as, as very exciting right now for Indigenous artists. And I, that's one of the, the main requirements is just to look at as much art as possible and listen to as much music as, as you can. Earlier this month, we reported that there has never been a Native person elected to Congress from Arizona. Navajo citizen Ginger Sykes Torres was hoping to change that, so she ran for one of Arizona's seats. She recently withdrew from the race after a lawsuit contested her candidacy. A lawsuit was filed contesting my candidacy, signaling me out from my Democratic opponents. The county determined that I did not have enough signatures indeed to qualify for the ballot this November, even though we submitted more than a thousand signatures above the required amount. And we thought we had a plan to move forward, but it appears that there was no path that could be found. So I did have to make the agonizing decision to withdraw last week as a result of the challenge. And like I said on the video, the lawsuit has not been easy to deal with because we were so close to getting such momentum across the country for my candidacy within the Arizona's Congressional District 1 race. 
um, through this time. It's been difficult, but I'm just so happy that I can be joined by my family and my friends have come to rally around me. I had a fundraiser planned after um, I announced a, a formally planned fundraiser. And so I ended up going to Albuquerque and being surrounded by a lot of my uh, college uh, classmates, also former professional colleagues and family and friends there. So we had a very nice conversation about kind of lessons learned from my race in particular, but also what this means moving forward and how to keep moving forward. Um, we know that Native Americans have been cast aside for decades in this country, and we fought through harder things. We fought through getting our culture stripped away during the boarding school era. And we were prevented from even voting in Arizona until the 1970s. And today we are still facing bills that are meant to suppress our right to vote here in Arizona. So I won't stop standing up for what is right and also paving the way for future generations. And um, with me getting pushed out of the race, it's at least another two years until Arizona has a chance to get a representative in our United States Congress of Native American heritage. So um, there's a lot to be done. Sykes Torres says she's not giving up. So I am not closing any doors at this time. I don't feel my work is finished. But in the meantime, while I decide, I'm definitely going to use my experience running to help other candidates that are running in this cycle in particular. We need to get Sharice Davids back into office. She is facing a very tough congressional race. And so um, along with her and several others at various levels in government that are running across the country, I will dedicate my time to helping them rise up. Indigenous people understand the importance of having a seat at the table. That's what's happening in Nebraska after a housing development is threatening ceremonial grounds near Lincoln. A prayer camp emerged and organizers Renee Sansusi and Kevin Abrask were joined by Aaron Poor to break this down. We have been what we feel systematically excluded from a years long development plan. Um, Native people have been here since time immemorial, and we've been coming to this particular land for salt gathering uh, along the Salt Creek um, for generations upon generations. More recently, we have been coming to ceremony here at a place called the Fish Farm um, to Inipi Ceremony, which was established in 1978. This lodge was established in 1978 here by Chief Leonard Crow Dog. And this land has been significant for us for those reasons and so many more. And um, this development process, which has been in uh, the works the last couple of years, has completely excluded Native people from this entire process. It was only about three and a half weeks ago that we were notified of this mega development. And that's when we realized our ceremonial grounds are in danger and we have to do something. Kevin Abresk explains what the Niskide prayer camp means. Niskite means salt in Umoho, and uh, this area was a convergence point for a lot of different tribal nations because of the Salt Creek River Basin here. People would come from as far away as Iowa, we're told, to come and gather salt. And um, some of the Omaha women would actually use eagle feathers to pick up the salt along the riverbank, and they'd take it home and they'd use it to cure their meat. So if you can imagine, you know, this is sort of like a demilitarized zone in a way, you know, everybody would come here and they would camp and they would gather their salt and they'd go back to their respective communities. Um, there's a lot of history here. And so our efforts here have always been done uh, in prayer. And we wanted this to be something that was graceful, that something that wasn't going to leave a huge imprint on the land out here. Um, we wanted to come out here and take a stand, absolutely, and express our sovereignty, express our resistance. Uh, but we also wanted to educate our community about our Native American customs, because in large part, what has happened here is because people don't understand our sacred Inipi ceremony, they don't understand uh, just the fact that, uh, you know, we've been having to fight this fight for, for generations, and uh, we're going to continue to do so as long as we need to. Renee Sansouci relates the reaction from the community. Well, everyone who's been coming here, uh, especially non-natives, <laughs> they come up here and they want to know, but they do so with a good heart. And so we sit down in circles and I explain the, the history, culture, our spirituality, and I'm educating them and everything. And they walk away. You know, some people break down emotionally and then they leave and they go, I'm, I'm, I want to do something to help you. So I feel like my message and our message together, you know, we all have our gifts. Our message is 
to bring, you know, to bring about awareness, to dispel stereotypes, to help people understand who we really are here, particularly in Lincoln, Nebraska. Main Hall at the University of Montana was lit red last week. It was one of many events bringing awareness to a crisis in Indigenous communities around the country. ICT's Colby Cooking Woman has this report. She went missing for almost four years ago today. <sighs> Relatives of Jermaine Charlo spoke through tears. The 23-year-old was last seen in a bar in downtown Missoula in the summer of 2018. Her family continues to search for answers. I wish I could tell everybody here that after four years, this gets easier. Talking about her gets easier, and it's not. Jermaine's story is one of many highlighted at this rally, bringing awareness to missing and murdered Indigenous people. Advocates here remembered other victims, and they talked through the heavy emotions of losing a loved one. It, it sometimes feels really hopeless, and it's heavy. As we miss those who were taken, missing, or murdered, as we miss them dearly, I'm sure they miss us too. So talk to them, think good thoughts for them, and pray for them. Community advocates like Lauren Small Rodriguez say they came out to remember relatives like Hannah Harris. The Northern Cheyenne citizen was found murdered in 2013, but her legacy lives on. Hannah's relatives worked with lawmakers to pass a day of recognition on May 5th as MMIW Awareness Day. You know, for Hannah Harris, you know, this is her birthday. This is her 30th birthday she would have been, you know, and so it's just, this is a solidarity movement, you know, and, and we're just, we're, we're honored to be a part of it. Now, events like this one in Montana are one of many held across the country on May 5th. In Missoula, Montana, Colby Kicking Woman for ICT News. Just when we thought we were out of the woods, new variants are causing COVID-19 cases to rise in parts of the country and around the world. Epidemiologist Dean Seneca explains. He leads Seneca Scientific Solutions and is a global expert in health sciences. We're far from being over with the pandemic. You know, I know that, you know, some of our leading experts have said, well, we're past this phase. You know, we're really not, you know, um, uh, there are uh, increases in cases that we're seeing, you know, uh, let, let's say last week throughout all of Indian country, all cases were on the rise. This week, we're seeing significant increases in the Bemidji area and the Oklahoma area and some small spurts throughout Indian country. So, you know, we're, this is far from over, you know, and these variants are subvariants of the Omicron variant, in which we saw that huge spike at the end of January, beginning of February. And that's kind of where uh, this is all coming from. Seneca doesn't give the United States high marks in response to the pandemic. Quite honestly, you know, we haven't done well, in my opinion. I would give it a, you know, a C minus, maybe a D plus, you know, uh, and, and, you know, because, you know, we're the example when it when you um, when you when all the other countries in the world are looking toward the United States as being you know the group uh, the example of how to uh, suppress a virus and do prevention and um, you know carry uh, do say social distancing do vaccinations and all these other things in order to address a pandemic and you know to be quite honestly honest with you um, we you know, we haven't really done well, in, in my opinion. I mean, I think there are a lot of things, you know, uh, one of the things that I do keep saying is that, you know, we're so much like a third world country than we're willing to admit it. You know, for example, you know, look at how slow we got out of the gate regarding this. Look at how this has turned into politics, the individual versus the community, right? You know, I mean, these are no brainers, right? It should, we should be focusing on the community, the greater good of everyone. Um, you know, our prevention, look at all the anti-vaccination and misinformation that's on the website that's created by people within the country. I mean, you know, these are, these are like characteristics you see in third world countries, or you see in places that, you know, are not, uh, where you have a population that isn't very educated or really understands, you know, uh, science. You know, right now, um, in my opinion, this is a real battle between science and knowledge, and quite honestly, ignorance. You know, I mean, that's those are the two things that we're facing right now regarding this pandemic and to, you know, get over the hump, which I still think, 
you know, um, that we have some real areas to be really cautious about when it comes to the fall and the winter season, you know, when the when uh, viruses really ramp up again. Seneca says future generations are at stake as we emerge from the pandemic. The children are, are what we really need to care for because caregivers, right? You know, the American Indian, Alaska Native population, the Asian Pacific Islander population, including, including this, you know, we've lost so many caregivers um, in comparison to other groups, right? Many, many of those caregivers, you know, had children and families to take care of, and COVID-19 took them. And the disparity there is insurmountable. It's like, you know, one in every 130, um, you know, families were impacted with caregiver loss, you know, comparison to the white population was like one in every 500. I mean, those are huge disparities. So a couple of things. One is, the COVID-19 has really has impacted these two years of educational attainment in our tribal communities, because we're actually seeing that now that, you know, those weren't that weren't in the classroom, those that weren't really studying like they should be, or those that, you know, didn't have access to good education, you know, we're going to see that as the future moves on. And then the other is this impact on caregivers. So our kids in the future, you know, they're going to be tested. You know, they have a lot of catching up to do. And in some situations, those kids are going to be the, the primary caregivers in their families, in their communities. And that's a whole nother burden on top of them, um, giving the anxiety and depression and other things that this that the COVID-19 has brought uh, light to in our communities. It's National Nurses Week, and one of them is featured in a new documentary. Whitney Fear is a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner in Fargo, North Dakota. Who Cares? A Nurse's Fight for Equity is part of a project called SHIFT, a community of nurses making positive change for each other and for their profession. The project is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Fear takes a holistic and trauma-informed approach to helping individuals with substance abuse disorders. Recovery can be really lonely. Um, and I speak to that from the perspective of behavioral health professional and as a person in recovery for myself and recovery from alcohol. And um, it, you, you really have to change your whole social circle um, because there is still going to be a lot of people around you that are, you know, that you used to spend time with that are, are still using and that's something that can be detrimental to, <clears throat> to your own recovery. Um, and also, you know, the, um, whenever people enter recovery and they, they still have a lot of stressors going on, which is, you know, often the case, trying to put into place like alternative ways of coping with things be, because our brain is so, um, you know, gets really fixated on, on, you know, well, you know, it, it has us thinking, well, maybe we should just go back to that other way of doing things because it's faster. Um, and so that, that pattern can be really difficult to break out of and, um, especially if it's a pattern that uh, people have observed from the time they were kids and, and their parents or grandparents or adults around them. And, and again, if they have peer pressure, um, societal pressure is a, you know, a big one, I would say. That's something we had kind of tried to highlight with the documentary and then and afterward is that, it, you know, the widest used substance in the state of North Dakota is alcohol. Um, and there's a, a big societal acceptance of alcohol in, in the state of North Dakota as well. So it, you know, it can be something I've seen a lot of patients uh, struggle with their families and, and loved ones taking their alcoholism seriously when they say, I have a problem, I need to not drink anymore. Oh, no, you don't. It's, you know, you can control it. You can still have drinks with us and things like that. So um, <clears throat> that's something that it's, it's difficult for a person to get to a point of admitting that that something um, is, you know, they, the, that difficult relationship with a substance. And if that acceptance is being met with a message of like, no, you don't have a problem, it can be, it can be difficult too. Fear talks about the importance of a supportive community. Nurses and, and well, and healthcare providers in general too. It can be, it can be really difficult for us to talk about the stress of, of the job and what we encounter with um, family and friends because it, it can be hard for them to understand. It can, um, it can feel like, oh man, how would I even like tell somebody about my day? Um, this is going to make them sad or, <laughs> um, you know, be difficult for them to hear some of the things that go on. And, 
it's so that peer support like that, like platforms like Shift are, are really helpful as you definitely know there's gonna be somebody who knows what gets what you're saying, gets what you're talking about. Let's take a look at the film. If you own a pair of Crocs, even though you know they're super ugly, you might be a nurse. If you have ever felt like Neo in the Matrix, like dogging, dodging shit that somebody is like throwing at you, <laughs> maybe that's just psych, but if you've ever had your ass kicked by an elderly woman. <laughs> that's a slice of our indigenous world. For more news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run.